tonight. Uh, we are going to get started here on our second lesson as we go through uh, 10 total lessons here this summer, uh, studying grasping God's Word. I have uh, made a challenge to uh, all of you as to who paid the least amount for their book. And I did uh, have confirmation of a $7 and so forth total delivered book last week. Uh, BJ has that, um, and I saw proof of that. However, Karen Arms says that she's got a deal. She bought a book for $2.71, and uh, with the shipping, it's $6.70. But she hasn't, here's the cash, yeah. she hasn't got it yet. Yeah. 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 So, so the verdict's still out. Joel Reyes, Joel's not here yet, he might come in late, but Joel said last week he was waiting on a $4 total purchase, but he hadn't gotten it yet. Now listen, get it is like a big part of this, right? It's serious. Like, you can go online, you can put your credit card out there for all kinds of things that are great deals, right? But it's just like getting it, you know? Bought a Ferrari for $1,000, just haven't seen it yet. It's been a couple of years. Um, so, so we'll wait and see. We'll extend it out, and uh, we'll, we'll see as the dust settles. Uh, if you don't have a book, um, we are in this book right here. It's called Grasping God's Word. It's available uh, most of the time online. It'll be a third edition. Uh, however, my students in China last year only had second edition. And so they asked me to do the second edition. And so um, my wife's using my third edition that I bought. And uh, I'll be teaching for the second edition with a few modifications. Uh, how many are here for the first time tonight? You weren't here last week, in other words. OK, great, great. Welcome. Uh, I want to just mention that uh, we will do a brief review within the unit here tonight. Uh, that will kind of help you um, uh, understand exactly where we are. The first lesson is called the interpretive journey uh, in the second edition. It's the first, or the, it's the first in the second edition. It's the second chapter in the third edition, which is what most of you have. And so that's what we did last week. We did number two. And tonight we're going to be looking at sentences, paragraphs, and very briefly discourses if we get to that point, all right? So uh, let me ask you to do this. And again, if you don't have a book, um, take copious notes if you like, or uh, pay attention, listen, and pick up a book, hopefully. At these prices, uh, how can you go wrong, right? If you're getting them for under $10. I mean, we charge more for that for our men's fraternity book. Like, it was like 14 bucks, right? And this is a whole blooming textbook, and it's something you can refer to later. So that's a pretty good deal, right? So um, if you look at the beginning of this under the table of con uh, contents, uh, you'll want to just take a note here with me uh, before we get started here tonight. Part one is listed there as how to read the book, basic tools. And we talked about the interpretive journey. We did not, those of you who have third edition, we didn't get into uh, the whole um, application of uh, versions, Bible versions. And we'll talk about that later. It's just they reversed the order when they did the third edition. Uh, how to read the book deals with sentences, paragraphs, and discourses. Most importantly, it's sentences and paragraphs, I think. You'll have to take your time uh, and read on your own the, the section on discourses. It's just we don't have enough weeks with 10 weeks this summer to be able to address every one of these chapters like I'd like to. Um, what I'd really love to do tonight is only deal with sentences. Um, but it's going to really mess up my schedule if we don't get into more than that tonight. All right, So just so that you are aware of that. So let's get started here. We'll have a word of prayer. And um, we'll dive right in uh, to this lesson. Father, we thank you for bringing us together tonight, Lord. And I just want to thank you, Father, for giving to us the Word of God. Uh, Lord, there are so many books, and the Bible tells us that uh, the writing of them, there is no end. But there's only been one that is truly God's Word. We are so privileged to have this in front of us. Not a page, not a section, not a discourse, but the entirety of your revelation to us. Help us, Father, as we glean from this uh, lesson material uh, how to better understand and know you and know your word. 
Help us, Lord, with us tonight, I pray, and guide our thoughts and our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to talk here about tonight uh, how to read the book, and we're going to start with the smallest of all of these, which are sentences. And uh, I see, Joel, did you ever get your book? Joel, did you ever get your book? No, I didn't. Uh, no. Did you hear that, Karen? Did you hear that? What? Joel is here. He did not get his book. <laughs> Karen thinks she's got one coming for $6 and some. She only paid $2.71 plus shipping, so that's pretty good. But uh, time is going to tell, right? All right, talking here tonight about, uh, uh, really talking about uh, sentences, one of the smaller <clears throat> aspects of the scripture, and it begins with an illustration. If somebody invited you over for dinner, what would you expect to find if you were invited to someone's house for dinner? Uh, would you expect to have something that was a real tasty meal? Maybe some real good substance to that meal? Uh, what would you think if I invited you over for dinner and uh, I pulled out uh, some baby food? Okay. Um, now I gotta confess, my grandkids love those Uncrustables. Have you seen those? Costco has a big box. They're peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, they come frozen. I am into those things. <laughs> okay. but, but I would find it strange if, uh, if I invited someone over to the house for dinner and Karen started firing those things up. Um, you know, I'd be all right with it, but I'm sure they would think that would be pretty odd, all right? And so as you look at what we expect as we come to God's word, that's a very important question uh, to, to answer. And he says here, um, we would disappoint our guests and really put a strain on the relationship if we fed baby food to the guests who are coming. And Bible study, he says, is much the same. Plunging into God's word is similar to sitting down at a meal. In other words, we expect when we sit down to a meal to find something that's nourishing, something that is, is solid, and something that's going to be substantial to us. And what we find so often today is that the, uh, the, the quality and the quantity of the spiritual feeding that we receive is oftentimes missing. Uh, take your Bibles, uh, go to Hebrews chapter 5 with me. Hebrews chapter 5, and verse 12. The, in all likelihood, the Apostle Paul is writing Hebrews. He says in verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. That's why if I get invited over to your house for dinner, I'm going to expect, hopefully, that there's a meal there that's got some substance to it. Why? Because I'm mature. I might not be mentally mature, but I am physically mature. I have teeth that have come in a very long time ago, and they're really great for chewing up things. And I'm able then to digest those things and to be able to process it. When we come to the Word of God, we're still looking for something that we can process. And we should be very disappointed when we come to the Word of God and we do not receive that. And that's why the Apostle's writing here, and he's saying, uh, at this point in time, in your spiritual development, saying this to the audience, you should be the ones who are breaking open the Word of God and actually teaching the Word of God to others. You should not, at that point in time, be still uh, dealing with the milk of the Word. There is a point in time when all of us dealt with the milk of the Word. When we first put our faith in Jesus Christ, people would say things that were so simple, but they were so profound, weren't they? I mean, people would say, listen, you really need to read your Bible every day. Really? Really? What, what, what should I read? You know? I mean, we, we sucked it all in. We were amazed to find out things like, oh, you mean once I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I can never lose my salvation? That's right. Let me show you. Here's a passage of Scripture. Really? Did you know that the Spirit of the Lord dwells within you? No way! I mean, these are things that we grabbed a hold of with the milk of the Word. But as time goes on, 
we are looking for more extraction of the Word of God. And unfortunately, uh, in Christianity today, in our culture here in the United States, we have been we have been going away from a deeper study of the Word of God. And uh, it's, it's problematic. It's really problematic. I remember visiting a church one time, and the pastor got through. He was preaching a message in the book of Romans. And he got through, and he said, and we don't really know the answer to this. And I thought to myself, that's really interesting, because if you read three verses down, like, there was the answer. Okay? You didn't have to know Greek. You didn't have to go to seminary. You didn't need Bible college. All you needed to do was read the blooming passage. Okay? And I'm serious. I was very, very disappointed in that uh, because I thought to myself, you know, how inadequately the preparation had, uh, had, had developed this message. And so, unfortunately, I walk away from, if I'm in the audience that Sunday morning, I walk away from, oh, I guess we just really don't have the answer to that. When indeed God has given the answer to that. And I'm pretty sure if God gave the answer to that, he wants us to know what it is. Would you agree? And so this is why it's important for us to, to take a look at the word of God and treat it uh, as something that we want to, to really focus on and extract as much from it as we possibly can. You'll note there in your, on your book there on this first page, where he says, uh, so let's begin. Here's, an, here's a statement that's worth paying attention to. If you move straight from your initial reading of a passage to the application of that passage, you will remain tied to your previous understanding of that text. Did you hear that? If you go straight from your initial reading of a passage to the application, you will remain tied to your previous understanding of the text. How many of us have a previous understanding of a text? Okay, every one of us does. We had a preconceived notion of what our Sunday school teacher was going to say in third grade when she said, today we're dealing with Noah and the ark. We already knew everything there was as a third grader to know about Noah and the ark. And so the ideas were, were she could have had the best lesson in the world, but we've already turned it off. We've already had these preconceived ideas. So here's our problem. When we begin the interpretive journey, here's a little bit of review for us. Where do we begin? Where do we begin? In their town. Okay, what does the text mean in their town? All right, what does it mean? What did it mean to the biblical audience of that day? And if we're going to be able to understand that and how that would be uh, able to be applied to us today, the next step is measuring the width of the river, right? Because in certain texts in the past, uh, it meant something to that audience. They knew and understood what it was. And it's very easy for us to make some understandings here in our day. And so we look at that and we say, well, here's a really wide river. It's really hard to understand how this fits today. And here's a really narrow one. I get it. I totally understand it. Uh, this is all coming out of that first or second chapter, if you have third edition, interpretive journey. The next step you have is to look for a theological principle. And then the theological principle becomes the bridge, doesn't it, between their town and us today. What it meant in the biblical audience's day and what it means for us today. That's the theological principle. <clears throat> Would you agree that theological principles are timeless? They are. They're timeless. You find a theological principle, it's going to be good for them back in thousands of years ago and us today. And after you determine, here's the theological principle, we added another step and we said that fourth step is we consult the biblical map. We look at the biblical map. How does this theological principle uh, align itself with the rest of the Bible as a whole? We don't, we don't want to start a heresy. We don't need any more cults. And so we want to be very careful that our theological principle is supported by Scripture in other things. Uh, people love to come up with novel ideas, don't they? they lo everybody loves a new idea. Oh, did you hear this one? It's like, oh, please. Um, but what we have to do is we have to do a lot of work in that whole process before we come to the point where we can apply that teaching for us today. 
And application is different than the theological principle. We spent some time on that last week. Theological principles are timeless. The application is very pertinent to us today. It's going to, to really relate to us where we are today, 2018. And so understanding if we have that principalizing bridge, that theological principle, we can make those applications that are really helpful and uh, we can understand then what the scripture meant and what it means. So those are, are important things for us to grasp. So we simply need to be able to look and understand what this passage says. Now, his next point was, was great. If you're a teacher um, or a, a preacher, he says you'll rarely see anything new if you're tied to your previous understanding. You'll rarely ever see anything new and exciting in the text, and the Bible will become boring to you. I'm not here. Um, and we don't want the Bible to become boring to us, do we? If I approach a text, and I'm looking to preach from that text, now at this point in ministry, having been in ministry for over 30 years as a senior pastor preaching, and many of those years I was preaching uh, Sunday morning, I was teaching a Sunday school class, I was preaching a message on Sunday night, and I was doing a Wednesday service as well. That was normative for the first 20 years. And then um, it changed, and the Sunday night service, uh, many places went away, and so in Massachusetts, before I came here for 10 years, I wasn't preaching that many times. But I've gone through a lot. I've got a big file and cabinet in my office, and I can take you to most books of the scripture, okay? And I can look at those notes, and I can just whip those notes right out and preach them this Sunday. Isn't that great? So I have to do very little work, actually. I, I work about three hours a week. Um, it's just the grandest job. Um, here's the point. Those old messages, I have a hard time throwing them out, but they are absolutely junk. I mean, just terrible stuff, you know? I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking to myself, how in the world did you come up with that? Or this is so shallow. It's like, did you even spend the time, you know, that you needed to? And, and I look at that stuff, and I haven't shredded them all yet, but when I retire, they're gone, okay? And most of the stuff is not good. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, every time you go through the Word of God, you should go through it afresh. You should be looking for the things that you've missed. You should be honing in, because the Word of God should be exciting to you, all right? It should be exciting to you. Hopefully, you can kind of sense that on Sunday mornings when I stand up and preach, I'm kind of excited about the passage. I mean, usually that's the case every week. I don't walk into the pulpit going, oh, well, they probably already know this. I'll just tell them it all over again, and we'll just move on, you know, uh, get done the Sunday morning thing and, and have our obligations met. But you come to the scripture, and it's so exciting. And God is always revealing new things. And as you pray, you're praying, Lord, help me to see this passage. Help me to understand it as I've never understood it before. And as you go through God's word, the one thing that's so amazing is that you absolutely never mine everything out of it. You never do. Uh, you can keep going and going and going and going over it, and you want to be very careful that you don't miss anything. Um, I've watched uh, uh, the show Gold Rush before. Have, have many of you watched Gold Rush? Uh, these guys are up in Alaska and they're looking for gold. And uh, they run this copium, copious amounts of dirt uh, through their equipment. And uh, they have water cascading down through and the gold is heavier than the stones. And so it tends to filter down to the very bottom and it gets caught in this matte mesh type stuff. And all these little pieces are tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces. And they are so careful about making sure that every bit of dirt has been run through that machine because they don't want to miss anything at all. And you would sit there and you look at these little tiny pieces that are just flats. And you'd sit there and say to yourself, oh, come on, move on. I mean, remember those guys back in the 49er days? You know, they're out there and, oh, you know, uh, Cornelius, uh, the guy on uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Ranger. Right? I mean, he's got that nugget, you know, and he's, or he's looking for that. I don't think he ever found one. But, uh, you know, those guys used to get these big honking pieces of gold. And uh, they were something to hold on to. Well, not anymore. I mean, occasionally they might find that. But th what they're interested in is these tiny little pieces. And they'll make millions of dollars with those tiny little pieces. That gold dust adds up. I think the one kid last year made $5 million. 
and none of them were nuggets, okay? And so the word of God is something that you can never mine the bottom of. You'll never find the bottom. Uh, there's always more theological principles to see. The Holy Spirit of God is working with a divinely inspired uh, book that is unique to everything else that we have. And it is so phenomenal to be able to see how God's word uh, just unfolds for us. Well, notice here uh, in, your, in your notes uh, that how we read things is going to be very, very important. And uh, you've, got, uh, you've got more of a, an elaborate uh, discussion here than I have in the second edition. Um, but it talks about how to read a love letter. Um, in April, Kevin and Whitney, and he goes on with this whole thing. Um, I want to read you mine in my second edition. You can read your own uh, edition uh, later. But it says, this young man has just received his first love letter. He may read it three or four times, but he is just beginning. To read it as accurately as he would like would require several dictionaries and a good deal of close work with a few experts, uh, etymology, and philology. However, he will do all right without them. He'll ponder over the exact shade of meaning of every word, every comma. She has headed the letter, Dear John. <laughs> what he asks himself is the exact significance of those words. Did she refrain from saying, Dearest John? Because maybe she's bashful. Would my dear have sounded too formal? Maybe she would have said, Dear so and so to anybody. A worried frown now appears on his face, but it disappears as soon as he really gets to thinking about the first sentence. She certainly wouldn't have written that to anybody. And so he works his way through the letter one moment, perched blissfully on a cloud, and the next moment huddled miserably behind an eight ball. It has started a hundred questions in his mind. He could quote the letter by heart. In fact, he will to himself for weeks to come because he's been waiting for this letter. Have you ever gotten an email that you just went over and over and over again? Well, the lovesick boy is a good reader because he is scrutinizing his text. He is looking very, very careful um, at every little detail, and he's, he's trying to question it. What was the intention? He's trying to, to figure it all out, and Honestly, most of us, when we sit down to read the Bible, we read it too quickly, and we skip over the details of our text. Um, you know, the, the through the year, Bible reading is a great tool. It really is. It's wonderful to, to read the Bible through every year. However, if that's how your only approach goes, you're going to find yourself missing a great deal of gold. Because as you read to try to fulfill an obligation to yourself, you're going to pass over passages very, very quickly. And the danger is, and I might be alone in this, but the danger is when I get to a passage of scripture that I'm familiar with, you'll never guess what I do. <laughs> I read it faster, right? I read it faster. You know, fruit of the spirit, love that piece of love, I'm right over the deeds of the blood. Deeds of the blood, are you know, and uh, all the while I'm trying to get to Galatians chapter 6, you know, and bearing one of those burdens, and I slow down a little bit, maybe read that a little slower. But, you know, it's interesting how we oftentimes do those types of things. And so often we find ourselves moving too quickly over a passage of Scripture. And that is in itself a huge problem because at an early stage, as we're looking at sentences at a very early stage, we want to refrain from applying the text or interpreting the text. These steps are important, he says here, but they come after we observe the text. So our first step is really how do we read seriously? How do we develop a, a skill in being able to observe the sentences in God's word? And there's several basic features that we want to look at. Here's a huge point that you want to stop and think about. He says, keep in mind that we are not yet asking the question, what does the text mean? We're simply asking, what does the text say? What does it say? Now, does that seem really elementary? Does it? 
It should. It should because it's so simple. It's crazy. But when you're prepping for something, maybe you're a teacher and you're looking at your clock and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I've got an hour to prep for this lesson. <laughs> okay. How do I take this passage and how do I put time into it to be able to understand what it exactly says? What we tend to want to do is what? What do we tend to want to do? We want to apply it. We want to figure out something. Exactly. We want to apply it. How can I apply this to my audience? Uh, we want to jump right ahead. Um, we, we're, we're too busy to read it seriously and be determined to find out what it says. We're jumping right to the point of what does it mean to me? And that's a problem. That's a huge problem. And if we truly want to go over this and find out what does it mean as God has given it to us, we have to slow the train down. We're going to have to take the time to really look at it very, very carefully. And again, looking at the big picture is part of it, and it's very important because everything is going to fit together. And that's why these three chapters that we have deal with sentences, they deal with paragraphs, and then discourses. And that's really, really important. Take your Bible, go over to Mark. Mark chapter, chapter 1. So on Sunday morning, we were in Mark chapter 1. And at this point in time, Jesus is going to leave the area where he was baptized. He's going up to Galilee. And we come in verse 18, and what we find him doing is, is actually backing it up to verse 16. He's calling to himself Andrew and Peter, and then later James and John. He's doing those things. Then we go to Capernaum in verse 21. He's teaching on the Sabbath in the synagogue, and uh, it's, it's a pretty miraculous time, but we have a demon-possessed person. We're going through all those things. <coughs> Now, if you're going to if you're going to teach on that passage, as I taught on it Sunday, what I wanted to do was I wanted to look very carefully at all the points that were in those sentences. But then I wanted to go from sentences out to paragraphs. So think of it as a lens. And think of it as, as a, taking a camera and looking right over your Bible with that camera. All right, you're looking through that lens. And then you're turning the lens so that instead of, oh, there it is, I have a whole sentence in my view, I open it up and now I have a whole paragraph in my view. And then I'm going to open it up more and I'm going to have the whole discourse in my view. So what was the main point about Sunday's message? Was it about the evangelism that took place with the four disciples that are mentioned does it have a, a main subject, uh, the exorcisms that Jesus performed or the healings that he did? What was the main point of that passage? The main point of the passage was what? Your title, A Day in the Life of Jesus. A Day in the Life of Jesus? It was only a day? Because as you're looking at that, that's, that's a key point to understand, isn't it? We would tend to read past that. Then you come to the very end of the day, and the next day begins, and we find Jesus alone with God the Father praying early in the morning. He gets up while it's still dark, and he's out there praying. And so we have an opportunity to see the entirety of the day of Jesus, right? And so as you look at that, all of a sudden that makes sense. That, wow, all this was part of this one day, and then it comes right down to it, Jesus needs to have uh, some, some refreshment spiritually as well. Remember, he's 100% human and 100% divine. And we find that it is very necessary for us to understand how that all fits together. Now, if all we did was stay way down on that lowest setting on our lens, we would read about uh, Andrew and Peter and James and John. And we might only have gone that far on Sunday morning. And by the time you came to the passage where Jesus goes and prays alone with God, we might have missed everything else. We might have missed the bigger picture. 
And so as you're preparing to understand God's word, it's very important for you to be able to, to, to build from that very small point and expand it on out so that you see the entirety of this is, this is the whole picture. Uh, once you do that, you'll be able to, to uh, really appreciate, I think, uh, better what the point of the passage is. All right? And it becomes easier then to understand what that meant in the biblical audience's day. And that's really, that's really your key. So as you look at God's word and you're studying it through God's word, you're trying to figure out, yeah, what does this mean to them in their day? What, what is he trying to, to say? And you go to the other Gospels, and it's fascinating, but they'll spend more time on some of these passages. And so the perspective is different. That's what you got to love about the Gospels, because you get different thrusts in different ones. And if I was preaching through Matthew, and there's this whole section there uh, about uh, selecting the disciples, that's where you'd be, because that's how far the discourse is. All right. So understanding how that all fits together is, is really the key. Good news is you don't need, need Greek, you don't need Hebrew to figure that out. You know, you really don't. Your greatest asset in understanding God's word is having a firm grip on the English Bible. Having a firm grip on the English Bible. You do not need to quit your job and go to seminary. All right? You really, really don't. Okay? And we're very blessed. We have some great translations of Scripture um, because they're all done by human beings with sin natures, with fallen brains. Um, they're not perfect, but they're, they're very, very good. And it's, it's, the tools are there for us to be able to look at these things and understand them. So hopefully as we, as we go through this, you'll see the importance of being able to stop and take your time with the passage at hand so that you can develop it and understand it in a way that allows you then to, to benefit directly and also challenge others, as you may be a teacher uh, at some point, if you're not already. All right, here's some things to look for when it comes to sentences. And uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of these, uh, there's a bunch of these things, without a doubt. First of all, you're going to begin by looking for the repetition of words. Look for words that repeat. You should have a, a passage there. 1 John 2, do you have that in the third edition? Chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. I want you to look through those three verses. And I want you to look for words that repeat. It's 1 John 2. Verses 15 through 17. <coughs> <coughs> Tell me one word that repeats itself over and over in there. World. World. All right, good. Great job. See, you're already well on the way. Fully comprehending this. All right, that's great. Give me another word that reoccurs. Love. Love. And so the word world and the word love are repeated there. As you look at that, we have, as he says there, an early indication of what this passage might be about, right? I mean, it's simple, but, but it's, it's really important to be able to look at this and understand it, right? It has to have something to do with the world, in particular, about loving the world, right? That's what this passage is about. And you can probably figure out that we're not supposed to love the world. And you would be right. Take your Bibles and go over there to 2 Corinthians, or look at your book there, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. There is a word that occurs. It occurs four times in the first sentence. What is the word that stands out there? Comfort. Comfort. So... We're looking at this passage and we're saying, whoa, look at how many times this repeats over and over and over again. 
I think it was Dave Cole last week mentioned that we were talking about something, and he said, yeah, look at how many times in Joshua chapter 1, you know, he's told to be strong and courageous. Yes, exactly. Great observation. That's exactly what you want to look for. And so as you look for the repetition, you're seeing it. It is happening, and it's important to note that. Another uh, point that you want to look for as you look at sentences is contrasting items. Proverbs 14, 31 is an illustration of that. He who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Two different kinds of people, right? we got the one who oppresses the poor and the one who is kind to the poor. And they're in definite contrast to each other. Other examples abound in scriptures. Um, in the New Testament, Ephesians 5, 8, for you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And so we have these contrasts that are going back and forth. Uh, 1 John 1, 5 through 7, uh, here he's talking about uh, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. What is the major contrast in that passage? Light and dark. So when we think about that, think about the specific nature of the contrast. Can we glean a little bit more? Sure, it breaks down into two parts. The nature of God, light and no darkness, and our manner of walking should be in the light versus in the darkness. So you have comparisons in that sentence, or uh, you have contrast in that sentence, and that helps us. Another literary uh, uh, way you're going to see things is with comparisons. So contrast looks at the difference between two things, but comparisons are going to focus sometimes on the similarities. And you're going to see this in Proverbs 25, 26, <coughs> where it says, like a muddy spring, or a polluted well is a righteous man who gives way to the wicked. Interesting. That's Proverbs 25, 26. How is the righteous man compared to the muddy sprint or the polluted well? Where is that comparison? When you're looking at that comparison, you're saying the righteous man would not have been compared to the spring that's muddy or the polluted well. However, because he gave in to the wicked, he finds himself the same. And so there's a great comparison uh, that's there. James chapter 3, another example, verses 3 through 6, you have the tongue compared to three different things. Three different things. What are the things that the tongue is compared to? In that passage, it's the bit in the horse's mouth, right? It's the rudder that steers the ship. And fire. Tongue's also a fire. And so you look at that and you think, wow, there's three things that the tongue is compared to. Those are pretty strong, aren't they? And so we're looking at those and we're saying, okay, I need to pay attention. Because if all he did was give us a comparison and say that the tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth. We might have a little bit of trouble understanding that, wouldn't we? Conceivably, we could. Um, if you don't have experience with horses, you might not know too much about what that bit does. I mean, I don't know what it means. I mean, I've had some experience with horses. I don't spit the bit always comes to mind. And I know that's not good, all right? Now, but if the next comparison comes along, I can understand that better. I understand the rudder principle. I understand that you can have a great big boat, and you can take that tiller arm, and you can steer that boat by guiding that rudder. And that little tiny rudder will change the entirety of the direction of that boat. And it's pretty amazing when you stop and think about it. And so I get it. The bit of the horse's mouth must have something to do with how I can turn it. Oh, yeah. So I started to understand it a little bit better. And so as these comparisons are given, they're worth paying attention to. So if you're teaching and you come to a sentence or you come to that, that small point that you're going to start from, you're going to actually look at that and you're going to say to yourself, okay, um, how do I understand this? Here's a comparison. 
and uh, you want to incorporate that into your understanding, and you're going to begin by just reading it to understand what it says. This is most basic, basic, basic. This is so basic, you're not even going to want to come back next week, but we're out of this section, and so we're going to be doing some good stuff. Here's the amazing thing. As you look at all these things, let me just give you a personal testimony. This chapter challenged me more than any other chapter in this book. And I stopped doing what I normally would do, and I started reading the Bible so much more carefully and looking so much more uh, with so much more scrutiny at every single word. And I'm still doing it. It's been a year, and I'm still doing it. And so when I read a verse of scripture, I stop to read it, and I don't assume I know what's there. Because there are lots of assumptions that we make. I can only speak for myself, but if I'm anything like a normal person, which I may or may not be, um, uh, I, I do that with regularity, and that's, that's something that's not good. And so I needed to go back, and I look at all these very simple things, and I sit there and say, wow, yeah, there's that, there's that, oh, there's that. And uh, it, it's all popping all the time to me. Um, a wonderful comparison there is Isaiah 40, verse 31, and uh, the renewal of strength, placing one's hope in the Lord, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings like eagle, eagles, and they'll run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. It has nothing to do with football. Uh, so just let point that out my way. Um, <laughs> all right, I don't know why I read that one. Should have kept going. <laughs> Noticing here the next one, moving right along. Lists. Anytime you encounter more than two items, it becomes a list. That's a list, and you want to pay attention to lists. First John two sixteen. Everything in the world, the, the craving of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. Uh, by the time you come, as I was mentioning, Gen, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, you have the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. It goes on. Uh, all of these things should trigger our attention when there is lists. So the lists are, are significant. And then another is cause and effect. And you see this a lot of times in Scripture, uh, where a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And you have that, that back and forth, and you're just picking up on this. You're reading through it, and you're saying, oh, okay, that's cause and effect. Oh, this is a comparison. Oh, this is a list. Oh, okay, I understand. Uh, this is a repetition of these words. There's something important there. Understanding these, these really small points will aid you in understanding the bigger picture. And you can't get a hold, this is the toughest thing, you can't get a hold of the big picture in a reliable manner unless you do the work looking at the smaller points and understanding them and then taking the lens and bridging it out so that you can see the, the discourse as a whole. So it's important to, to know how all of these things will fit together. Let's go on to figures of speech. Figures of speech are images um, where words are used in a sense other than the normal literal sense. You can think of a lot of these. Who, who can think of some figures of speech in scripture? We have some illustrations there, but can you think of another one? Can you think of something else? <coughs> Figures of speech. And in a figure of speech, you can't take it literally. That's the key. They're like salt. Okay. Salt. Yeah. We're like salt. Like light. God said the Israelites would eat the nostrils. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> the Lamb of God, that's a figure. Right, he was not a literal lamb. Jesus said, I am the door. He didn't have the door handle on his back. So you have a lot of figures of speech that you recognize as such, and obviously that helps you. Because as you're trying to understand these passages, you're going to see them for what they are. Some of them are very easy to, to pick out, and some of them can be a little bit more difficult. 
Unfortunately, they have that Isaiah 43, 31 passage again. Um, and he talks in there about soaring on wings like eagles. And he uses that illustration because it's a figure of speech. Uh, you're not going to literally start to fly because you're a follower of God, as cool as that might be, right? You have to wait till the rapture, and uh, then you'll be all set. Uh, figures of speech are powerful. Uh, they paint images that are... Uh, images that we can understand and kind of relate to uh, emotionally. They can be images of blessing or like the eagle. Um, they, they can be images of judgment or something that's negative, but they're powerful. Matthew 23, uh, 27 is a good example. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. So that's a powerful statement. It was figure of speech, though, that he uses. They're not literally that. And the Bible is full of these types of figures of speech. Psalm 18.2, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. We know what that means, don't we? He's my rock. Uh, he's not literally a rock, but we understand, and that's a figure of speech. We have figures of speech all over the place in the English language here uh, as well. So some things there that are worth noting. Conjunctions is another literary tool. And if you think of uh, uh, the Bible as a, as a house of bricks, the mortar is the conjunctions. It's going to tie things together. It's very important, all of these conjunctions. They are words like and, for, but, therefore, since, because, um, Kai, they, in the Greek, they're very important. If you find a conjunction, that's the word but, you can probably assume that what's coming, what, what tool is coming, something we were already just talking about. Contrast. A contrast, right, yeah. Um, and it's very, very common. Wages of sin is death, but we have a conjunction, okay? The conjunction indicates that there's that contrast between the wages of sin and the gift of God. Another one that's very popular is uh, something we see all the time, therefore, right? Usually presents some type of conclusion based on something that happened earlier. And it's, uh, it's important to, to note some of these. He gives the illustration here of Romans chapter 12, uh, therefore, I urge you, brothers, um, to offer yourselves as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know that verse. Um, therefore, my beloved brethren. When you see the word therefore, they always used to say to us, ask what it's there for. Well, it, it's going to have an, it's going to be impacted by what went on before it. And the challenge for you as a Bible teacher, a Bible student, is being able to understand how far back that goes. Now, Pauline writing, just to give you an idea, Pauline writing has its own peculiarities. Paul has his own style. But when you go to many of the epistles, what he does is he'll lay out all of the doctrine that kind of presents itself as a foundation before you get to the application parts. So you'd love to go to Ephesians and dive right in, you know, but be kind one to another, you know, um, tender-hearted, loving, and, and so forth. But there's a reason why he makes those statements. In other words, he just doesn't come out of the blue with those statements. He builds this foundation. So you come to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, and there's a lengthy amount of chapterage you like that, word? Uh, that goes before it that builds you up to that point. So when he says, therefore, my brethren, present yourselves a living sacrifice, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? Now remember, this isn't just Paul writing. This is God telling us. He's saying, Kevin, me, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto me. And I would ask the question, why? And the word therefore gives me the reason. And I look back through and I see all these wonderful things that God has done for me. And I see how God gave Jesus Christ to this world to come and to pay the penalty of my sin. I read passages that precede it that says, by sin, uh, by one man, sin entered the world. But through one man, 
that sin is taken away in the person of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus has a claim on me because I've placed my faith and trust in him. Therefore, it is a reasonable expectation that I, as a follower of Jesus Christ, should become a living sacrifice. Does that make sense? And so all that just builds out of that one conjunction. And it's important for us to be able to understand, hey, how far to back does that go? So whenever you see the word therefore, ask what it's there for, but ask specifically how far back does that go? Here's an easier one. He's got it there in your book, uh, and it's he, uh, Hebrews 12, uh, verse 1. That one's easier. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that easily entangles us. So, therefore, can easily be found in the previous chapter. So you only have to go back one chapter, and you can find out that the people in chapter 11 are the only cloud of witnesses that are available in this context. So it's easier to pick it up. So it's all going to depend on the context uh, exactly you know, what you're trying to do. But you're looking at it, and you're trying to figure out, okay, you know, uh, what are some of the particulars with regard to how the, the uh, author of the passage writes. If you notice, you want, I want to show you something just kind of interesting. Take your Bible, go to Ephesians chapter 1. Talking about peculiarities with the author. Who wrote the book of Ephesians? Paul. The Apostle Paul. To the saints who are at Ephesus who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the beginning of a new sentence. Would you agree with that? Tell me where that sentence ends. <laughs> Just before verse 5. <laughs> Here's the crazy thing about it. In your modern translations, it goes down through, you got a period at the end of verse 6, you've got punctuation along the way. But what you want to do is you want to dig around a little bit, maybe look at a commentary, something like that. What you'll find is, Paul doesn't end this until he says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. That's the end of verse 14. That is one of the longest sentences in the Bible. And the Apostle Paul is just perfect for that because he loves doing that. And you hate it when you're professor says, okay, so you're going to diagram the sentence. <laughs> what is the main clause, right? Okay, uh, mercy. Okay, that, that's above my pay grade. I, you know, man, oh man. But uh, what you want to do is you want to try to find out what are some of the peculiarities that apply to the, uh, definitely apply to the, to the authors. Okay, verbs. Let's go on to number eight. Verbs here. Verbs are where all the action is. Without a doubt, uh, they're important because they communicate the action of the sentence. And when you stop and you think of these, these verbs, you have a lot of, um, there's just a lot to them. And this is the reason why people say, well, why do you like the New American Standard Bible? Why do you preach from that? Uh, that has the best translation of the verbs. Sometimes it's lacking on the nouns, to be honest with you. Uh, but it's right on the money more than any other translation with regard to the verbs, and that's why I like it. And the verbs are the most important part of language because in the original, they come in past, present, future tenses, and they have a lot of different indicators that go along with it. Uh, for instance, let me see. Um, If you look all the way back at uh, 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, under repetition of words, do not love the world or anything in the world. Uh, verse 15, they use the negative. John uses the negative in front of, 
a verb which is an indicative mood, which doesn't mean anything to you, I get that. But literally when you translate with that negative in front of that particular verb, literally it should translate, stop loving the world. That's what John said, stop loving the world. Now it's a lot nicer if we read it, do not love the world, right? Because then I'm not assuming you love the world. But if I said to you, stop loving the world, I'm assuming what? I'm loving the world. And so here's the problem. As you read through that, right, you go through that and you look at it and you say, whoa, that's, that's, a, that's a strong point that needs to be considered. So when I'm reading through that and I look at that, I say, ooh, okay. So God's already assuming that I'm loving the world. And you know what? It's amazing, but he's right. He's right, right? I mean, we have a problem loving the world. And if we're not loving the world today, we have a, a tendency to want to love it, don't we? And so he, he makes that, uh, that, that point for us. Um, we want to look at <coughs> verbs when you're looking and you're just going through and you're reading. Look for verbs that are active or passive. Active are those in which the subject is doing the action. I'm going to throw the ball. And passive is I'm going to what? I'm going to catch the ball. So here it is. I throw it. I catch it. And there's actually a, a middle voice. Uh, that actually is uh, a Greek uh, voice which will allow me to throw the ball myself, okay? So I don't want to get too complicated, but it's really cool uh, because it helps us to understand certain things, certain points. Uh, but it's throwing, it's catching, and yeah, you can juggle, I guess, all right? So all of these things are, are pretty important. Pronouns are also significant. You're looking for, you know, who does it mean when it says our and us? Uh, those are important aspects as well. So all these things are, are very, very important. So how do we take the time to look carefully at words that are in front of us? Right? I mean, this is an important uh, point, isn't it? Would you agree? Uh, stopping to look at things very, very carefully. Let me have you do an exercise. I want you to take one minute, and I'll time this for you, and up here on this board there's a, a simple sentence that says, finished files are the result of years of scientific study combined with the experience of years. I want you to count the F's. You got a minute or less. I want you to count every F that's up there. And when you're done, I want you to write the number down. You've got to write the number down. It's pretty simple, right? Does everybody see it OK? before will come up with three. They'll come up with three. And three's not good enough. And it's just the weirdest thing. So uh, you, um, you aren't alone, Pam. Everybody that did this before, they all come up with three to start with. I'm just saying. All right. So you guys, uh, the rest of you that did it and you got six, you're advanced and what can I say? <laughs> Here's what I want you to do now, especially those of you who are so advanced. Why don't you take your Bible and go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and you'll see there in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, this is an assignment in your book. Find a minimum of 30 observations. 
in Acts 1-8. And you don't have long either. It's on page 64 in your book, and you can use your book if you want to write in it. Or if you want to sell it on Amazon when you're done, it's right now. You're looking for 30 observations in Acts 1A. And you're specifically spending time looking for some of those literary points that we just got through talking about. interpreting any of the details. Don't have to have 30. We're going to stop in three minutes. It's probably pretty easy for you to have 30. in the third edition. Oh, I have to say. Second edition, 40.
Are you still flying things? No. <laughs> Got the low hanging fruit. That's all. Right? That's good. That's good. One more minute for those who are still digging. I'm sure that uh, a lot of these popped out to you and there were many things that were pretty easy for you to see right off. Uh, usually that's the, the way and there's certain things that, um, you know, that are just pretty much e you know, easy observations. And what I want to do is just pop around the room and uh, give me some. You can give me that low hanging fruit. That's fine. Anybody? Conjunction. Conjunction, but. That's right. And list. You saw a list, and what was the list? All right, all those places. Good job. What else? Cause and effect. Verbs, cause and effect. Cause and effect. And where did you see cause and effect? Um, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power. All right, that's great. The verbs are passive. <coughs> To a point, the first one you are going to receive. receive, and then you will be, which is what? Active verb. So we have a passive verb and an active verb right then. Repeating words. Repeating words, great. The word you, used three times. Exactly. Pronouns. Pronouns. Okay, good. Figure of speech. Figure of speech. Where do you have a figure of speech? Ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth. So that's not literal, is what you're saying. I don't know, I wrote down where it is. <laughs> See, back then the earth was flat. Yeah. <laughs> so when the end of the earth, too, it's like, the words do they do? Okay, figure of speech. That's good. That's good. Um, is the Holy Spirit coming upon you a figure of speech? You know, I don't know. I mean, it, it could be. Ken asked if uh, it's a figure of speech, the Holy Spirit comes on you, comes upon you, and I don't have the answer. It's kind of, I can see it, but I don't know for sure. Asking the obvious question, does the Holy Spirit come upon you? Yes. Yes. So then it wouldn't be a figure of speech. Could you speak up? Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, if, if we know that the Holy Spirit comes upon us as believers, so it could be a figure of speech, but in this instance, I don't think it's a figure of speech because we know that to be true. All right. Well, so I, I don't know. I, I'm just trying to think of the English that I yeah. in third grade. So we, we know that the Holy Spirit dwells within us, um, coming upon us. I can see it both ways. I definitely can. Like if I came around a corner and I came upon you, it doesn't mean that I literally got on you. Right, right, right. But it's a figure of speech thing. Okay. I can see what you're saying. Yeah. True. Good. See, I love what you're doing because you're starting to look at this and you're looking at it carefully. And that is really, that's really your key. That's really your key. Another observation. But, the word but implies a contrast of, of uh, uh, conversation. Exactly. Exactly. There is a contrast when you see that word but. There is a contrast. We just don't have the verse number seven that's prior to this one. But you're right. Absolutely right. 
Comparisons. Times and seasons. Okay. You see a condition? Is that what you said? But sets a condition also. Is, okay. you know, there's a broad base, but, you know, it's not like someone says, I love you, but. <laughs> it's <Right>. conditional. Well, it says that you do be a witness to me and not like of me. I don't, that's a little different. And, yeah, and, and different, depending on your translation, you may have it a little bit worded differently there. In the book that I'm looking at, it was, and you will be my witnesses. Okay, <laughs> So it can, it can vary, yeah. Just the definition of words. What does power mean? Okay. Where is Judea back in their, their day, in that town? Mm -hmm. in that, where exactly is Samaria? What do they mean by Jerusalem? Is this a geographical thing? Is this an ethnic issue? Is there a... Right, right. As, you, as, you and, as opposed to saying, oh, I know where that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But now we're interpreting. Yeah, you got to be careful. I mean, we're just at this point. Um, you you are looking at it from the standpoint of um, these are literal places where where we would understand he's speaking directly to. You know, these are literal places. And, and by being cautious about interpreting, don't you mean there's the literal language interpretation, which is different from interpreting the meaning, which is what you're asking us to hold back on, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. What we're doing is we're, we're observing. Yeah. Okay. But Samaria versus Jerusalem, Samaria not being the Jewish area, is that interpretation or is that just a knowledge of yeah. time? For this exercise, that's a matter of interpretation. So, but it's it's a logical place you're going to go after doing this, right? right? So, without a doubt. But I mean, if you were at the time and you read this, that would have more meaning than that to us. Sure, sure, yeah. But what we're doing here in this exercise is we're only looking at what does the passage say, not what it means or what is meant by Samaria, meant by Jerusalem, meant by power meant by anything else. We're just looking for literary components as, as we're just reading it straight up. Verb tense, uh, present and future, will receive, yep. will be, so it's an action that is going to be uh, completed at some point, which is a receiving the Holy Spirit, but will be indefinite. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You, you want to definitely look at that future tense and, uh, and, and pick right up on that. That's an important point to this. Yes. Secondary effect there is given as cause, as cause and effect, not only with the new world receive power, but also you will be my witness. Yeah. 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 I have uh, I have cause and effect, and I have an arrow, witnesses in Jerusalem, Holy Spirit's power comes upon you. That's the, the cause and effect that I saw. But you're, you're right. I mean, and there's a couple places there where it turns, and you can have the cause and effect. <coughs> So as you're looking at this, what you're doing is you're picking up on, on what the passage actually says. And that's where it all starts. That's where this whole thing begins. It begins by a lesson of observation, right? And so as you bridge out from this and you read in the text uh, next week's lesson, um, which unless you want to go till 9 o'clock, which I'm guessing you don't, um, we have, we have we have babysitters, so we have to be kind. Um, so what you want to do is you want to read the illustration about the crazy fish in the next chapter. And you want to do that before you come next week. And when you come next week, there's an exercise that we're going to start out with. And I, I think it will be interesting for you. So uh, again, we're working on slowing things down to take a really, really close and detailed look at the passage in front of us. So we're, we're doing that on purpose. It's very intentional. So you can read about that crazy fish for next time. All right. Uh, any, any questions or observations, Dave? Um, question going way back to the beginning. When you were talking about um, the, the verse 
first, and I don't have a front of me, but the needy versus, or, or the poor versus the needy. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that would set off a bell that they're two different words and they have two different meanings. And yet, we just assume they both mean the poor. Yeah. And when do you start looking at <laughs> word meanings in that sense? Because um, where I used to work, they lock us in a room with lawyers, and we would have to define words down to that level that needy and poor mean two different things. Sure. Because you can be needy and not be poor. You right. can be rich and still be needy. Right. And for the purpose of what we're doing here tonight, we're just looking at contrast. Well, That's, I know that, but at yeah. what point do you look at those? Is yeah. that coming? I mean, <laughs> as as we as we go along this process, what we're we're doing is starting to break the foothold to the bottom of it. But what we do as we go on, we understand what we have to do in order to be able to gain the meaning from it. And so that's kind of an important point. But the whole, the whole 10 weeks that we'll do this summer is kind of getting you to understand that. My other question is the punctuation that's in here, you know, 14 verses of one sentence. Right. Whereas my, the thing I'm reading has put two periods in there. Yeah, mine too. And so, how significant is that? I mean, is that going to impact meaning? And, and how do we know that, whether yeah. it does or doesn't? Yeah, and it, it really won't um, impact meaning as much as it will impact how you would go about teaching that. Um, from the standpoint of, if you were going through, say, say you were a preacher teacher, and you're going through and you're going to teach verse by verse, and you're going to stop at verse 6, because there's a period there, and there's so much information between verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, that would not be maybe the wisest thing to do, because we're looking at things in too narrow of a focus. What we want to do is widen it out so that we can understand the meaning of that entire thing. I would never want to teach Ephesians chapter 1 without looking at verses 3 through 14 as a whole unit and teaching it as such, right? So as you prep for it, and again, we'll get to all this as you kind of go through this uh, study, but you, there are tools that will help us. So if you don't have a Greek to New Testament in front of you, that's not the end of the world. You don't need it because there's so many tools out there that will tell you things like, oh, by the way, this is one sentence in the original, and that's all you need to know. Once you would read that, you would say, yeah, I definitely have to make that oh, a solitary uh, teachment there. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of move through those different phases to, to understand um, those components, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, some, some translations will kind of put breaks in and kind of show you that, or study Bibles by mention it, um, but it's not, again, it's not the end of the world. Uh, I do think that the benefit that we have, and I think we, we need to do more of it, um, we used to talk about expository preaching, and, and expository preaching was always the end all, right? It was expository preaching, this is what we want, we want expository preaching. The problem is that, um, and it, it's, it's kind of rephrased itself over time, I would call it text-driven preaching is what we need today, more than expository preaching. I remember the time, and I can tell you where I was, but I stopped preaching a particular way. In other words, I would always prep, and I would go verse by verse. And you may always hear that. Well, yeah, he goes verse by verse. Well, that's great in itself, and there's so much there in that verse. But you can mine it out, and you can find all these little points. Nothing connects. And so you don't get the whole meaning of that passage. And I remember the point in ministry when I said, you know what, I'm done just doing the verse by verse because I'm feeling like I'm standing in front of a tree, but I can't tell the people there's a forest there. Or I'm standing in front of a tree, but I can't tell them there's a desert all the way around it. And so uh, for me, the preparation and the preaching and teaching changed because I tried to, to take the lens and come out. And that happened back in around 2000 for me. Um, and it was a definite marked change. And uh, now, now you're seeing more and more people have grabbed a hold of that whole idea and they're doing what we would call text-driven preaching. So we're trying to find out what does the text of this actually mean as opposed to diving in. 
uh, as a pastor, I'm not trying to write a biblical commentary, right? So I don't need to go verse by verse and try to explain everything. And what we need, I know what I need, is I need to know how does it all fit together, right? How does it all fit together? So if I'm going verse by verse this past Sunday, um, I just got through Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And next week, we're going to Capernaum, all right? It'll take us a whole month till we get to finally Jesus getting up early and going out and praying. But to me, that's, the, that's the, what this whole thing is about. And so I don't want to miss that. And so again, it's text driven versus verse by verse. So hopefully, you know, for whatever it's worth. Okay. But um, anyway, we'll, we'll go through. A lot of these questions are great questions. And, and uh, as the time goes on, the whole process expands out. And you'll kind of see how it all fits together. The authors did a great job um, being able to do that. So hopefully that's helpful. But come alert next week, ready for an exercise, so you won't want to miss that, right? All right, read about the fish. That's your clue. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? God, we just want to thank you for the time that uh, we just talked about your word and uh, how we might come to address it, Lord. I thank you, Father, for the time spent. I pray, Lord, that even tomorrow morning when we get up and we read your word, uh, that, Father, we would read it uh, seriously. We would really look at it and and try to determine uh, some of the uh, literary devices that we've looked at even tonight uh, to read it carefully and understand first what does it actually say, not as important what we think it says. But help us, Father, to look at it carefully. And help us, Father, to be good students of the Word of God, that we might be able to uh, truly extract uh, the meaning uh, and be able to apply that then in our own personal lives, Lord, in the lives of our families, in the lives of uh, those who we might be ministering with. So, God, thank you again for bringing us together tonight. Uh, give us uh, a great balance of the week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.